Viewers and subscribers, welcome back to Beating the Press Podcast. I am your host, Rafa. Now, coming up this weekend, we have a few very exciting matches. And joining me this evening to preview these matches, we have returning to the podcast, Sugar Belly. Greetings, viewers and subscribers. We also have Leon. Greetings, greetings. Yes, viewers and subscribers, we are going to be previewing two of the big fixtures coming up on the weekend. The first one we'll be looking at, we'll be looking at Liverpool versus Aston Villa. Both teams looking to make progress and secure their places in Europe. And of course, the big one on Sunday, the one that could very well decide the title. Man City versus Chelsea. Now we're going to jump right into it, gents. Liverpool, Aston Villa. Sugar Belly, how do you see this one? Liverpool, Red Hat Farm, Aston Villa, playing very well as well, looking to push into Europe. Talk to us. Oh, Sugar Belly, seem to be not to be hearing us. Leon, you want to take this one on? No, no problem. Um, Liverpool versus Aston Villa. We know that one team, Red Hat in Farm, I think Aston Villa has two wins in the last five, but they got a crucial win against Tottenham. Last last week, so I think, and it's playing at Liverpool and full as well. So I yes. think, I think it would be like even a betting man would bet on Liverpool at this point. But as we know, the ball is round and different tactics maybe maybe may come in play. So it's just, I think a, a Liverpool win would be the would be the guess. But we can never rule Aston Villa out with United. You know, yes, definitely. Uh Liverpool red at farm and beaten in I believe the last nine. Which Nine include, matches. yeah, pretty much the last time Liverpool was beaten was by Man City, where they were trashed 4-1, I believe. And since then, they drew 0-0 with Chelsea, 2-2 with Arsenal. And I believe from there on in, it has been seven wins on the bounce. You know, both home and away, of course. So this one... Taking place at Anfield, Liverpool definitely looking to push for that top four, a point behind United. However, of course, United do have a game in hand. And of course, Newcastle today sealed up a magnificent victory over Brighton. So they are looking to secure their spot in Europe as well. And at this point in time, I would say they seem out of sight for both Liverpool as well as Manchester United. So it's really down to the wire in terms of that final spot for Champions League. And of course, if not the Champions League, then Liverpool will be looking to secure their future in the Europa League. And Aston Villa likewise is making a big push for a European Position as well. Maybe the Champions League is a bit too far for them, but definitely a spot in the Europa League or the Europa Conference League would definitely be an objective at this point in time for Emery. Actually, and of I course, think, yeah, I think um, I think that would be the aim. I think they are trailing behind Brighton and Brighton, Brighton and Liverpool, as I said. But I think that would be the aim for you, and Emery, this season to try to get into at least a conference league place because we see West Ham advance into the final, so it could be a good chance to get a silverware, especially with the Unai Emery's European pedigree. So I yes. think that's the aim for Unai Emery right now. And definitely since he has taken over, Aston Villa has been progressing very well, and I am sure he would love to see uh, that farm being maintained up to the ribbon, you know? Uh pretty much just capitalizing on the, the position they're in and the opportunity to play some European football next season. And of course, we know that is definitely a main attraction for recruiting top talent as well. Once you're in Europe, then that's an added incentive for top talent to, to come to your club and to represent your club. And of course, by doing so, you, you're looking to grow, expand, and of course, continue that progress in the league and even make a push for a, a Champions League berth. You know, Aston Villa is a pretty big club uh, with a rich history as well. I believe Aston Villa even have a Champions League under their belt. Uh, yeah, Unlike think, Arsenal or even a Man City currently. Uh, Man City for now, but they're yeah, well <laughs> on their way. But even, yeah, and one thing that, that um European places does for a club is also the spending money because you get, um you get 
extra money from the league for qualifying in European places so their budget could increase. And a coach, as you, you know, Emery, will never, any coach per se will never turn down more money. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of incentives to get the, those European places for our clubs. Definitely. But Leon, in terms of tactics, let's get down to the nitty gritty of this one. Tactically, we, we see Klopp, I would say, copying the tactics of Pep by, you know, mm. implementing Trent in that midfield role. You know, playing right back in a defensive setup, but then when the team is on the attack, he tucks into the middle and pretty much is almost acting as a, you could say, the basketball analogy, almost like a, a, a point guard. The dictating the play, so to speak, spraying the passes and, you know, somewhat opening up defenses with some magnificent passing. And of course, he does have a quality shot from outside as well as from set pieces. And the fortunes of Liverpool have shifted as this tactic have been implemented. So how do you see this taking place and why have teams not nullified Trent in this position? I think it's. I think you're right with with the. I think the the, the change enough trend to the middle middle. I think that is the catalyst of for Liverpool doing so well because, especially in recent times, they've they've been targeting targeting him down the right flank, and I think him tucking in the middle. I think Konate with that extra speed can get over to the right flank while Trent would cover him in the in the middle, and I think that's a. That's a tactic that I see um, teams hardly figuring out because even Salah seems to have more freedom because Trent, Trent, is, um, Trent is dropping everywhere and can link the play with Salah. And his various passes makes it difficult for teams to, um, to press him. And as I said, he, in, the youth, in the youth team, he was a centre midfield and he looks very comfortable in there. And I, did, I don't see any really loose touches. There. It's, just, it's like he was made for this role. And I think... Another tactic that would be very interesting in this match, in this match per se, is Aston Villa Highline. I was I was realizing it from they played Manchester United, and I think it's it was a, it, it's a common it's a common um they yeah. they've been repeating it in yes recent message, and and I think Salah on that back back line, I think Diaz on that back line, maybe Darren Nunes on that back line, it's going to be a problem for them if they go into this Anfield. <laughs> With this, with this high line, per se. Yeah, that's a very interesting point there. Uh, I mean, Liverpool themselves were criticised early in the season for deploying such a high line, which was exploited on numerous occasions by teams running in behind, especially down their left side and Liverpool's right, which would oftentimes uh, catch Trent out of position. And that side of the Liverpool defence seemed to have been targeted by many teams. But Klopp seemed to have found the, the formula, as you said, the catalyst, you know, to pretty much nullify such a threat and, of course, give the Liverpool team uh, what I would classify as a bit of unpredictability. I believe the Liverpool team, when the season started, became stale, you know, became yeah. predictable by, by, by other teams. You know, their tactics were figured out and coaches, opposition coaches could implement their own tactics in order to nullify Liverpool because they knew exactly what they were bringing to the table. But Klopp has now but revolutionized somewhat his tactics and he, he is you know getting the result because of the level of unpredictability which has now kept, crept back into the team. And I think another, um, another aspect of this trend in the midfield, it assume, Liverpool assumes a lot more control and they say the best form of defense is attacking. So with Trent in the midfield now with a numerical advantage, I think Liverpool keeps the ball a lot better. And I think even when they lose loses the ball, there there's more persons in the midfield to apply that kind of gen gang press. It's not it's not that in its entirety, but it's similar. So I think they, they win back the ball a lot quicker. And with more of the ball it's it's hard for you to target the team or their weak ears without the ball. And I think that's a and that's why we see Liverpool sustaining their attacks much more. Yes, definitely. But we know Emery is no fool when it comes to coaching and, and managerial responsibilities. So what is it that Emery, the Aston Villa coach, can bring to the table for this one, which will see them nullify such a threat 
and of course imprint their own style on the game. I think um the um, the blueprint that he that he had when he just came when he just came to um, Aston Villa with the with back in the midfield. I think the last match it was more of a four four two with Leon Bailey coming back in the side. But I would say for this for this fixture especially, I think you would leave Leon Bailey on the bench and expect a like a, a impact like later down in the matches and start with either Kamara or Dendonka to help um pack that midfield so to um nullify Trent a little bit and then try to hit Liverpool on the counter with all the pace of Ollie Watkins and Jacob Ramsey and, and Buendia. So that would be my way to combat this Liverpool new formation. Yes, that's uh you do raise an interesting point there, Leon. You know, it it oftentimes a football game is one or lost in the midfield. And we saw that with Liverpool that early in the season when results were not going their way, it was the midfield that took the brunt of the blame, you know, whether through injury or, you know, poor form or midfielders losing a step, aging out, etc. It was the Liverpool midfield that was called into question. We've now seen where this has somewhat improved and so have the result. And your idea of definitely packing the middle, uh, you know, matching up at least three V3 in that midfield zone should prove a worthwhile tactic and could very well lead to some success for Aston Villa. The, the fascinating thing for me, however, is that while Aston Villa has been doing very well at home, their away farm is somewhat of a concern and the results haven't been as impressive as when they play at home. So that is definitely an area of concern, but for sure... I'm sure Emery will will you know find the right tactics to match with what Klopp may very well bring to the party. Actually, I think I think the dynamic between home and away is interesting because at home you expect to attack, and away I think if you're not at a bigger a bigger team, you'd expect to like but, but buckle down a little bit, and I think that's where Aston Villa um, is losing a, a lot of away matches because I think they have a similar approach for home and away. Mm. And I think they, they have been caught out away because at home, you know, you have the, the fans' advantage. You have players playing with extra morality. But right, right. when you're away, you're, you're to the mercy of the opposition fans and you'll make mistakes because of the pressure. And I just think that you, you and I maybe can go a little more cautious like away, but I think that's the, their main the main difference between home and away for them. Indeed, definitely. But in terms of a result for this one, Leon, how do you see this one playing out? And and what's your predicted scoreline? Um, I think my predicted scoreline is that I think it's a 2-0 to Liverpool. I think that I've watched Aston Villa Aston Villa in the last matches, and I think that high line is what's giving me problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think Liverpool in this form will will eat up that. Highline for sure. So I think it would be a 2-0, I would say, for to, towards Liverpool. Uh, I must agree with you someone, somewhat. I do see Liverpool coming out victorious in this one, you know, in front of their home fans. Definitely motivated. And with Salah, the, Salah the, in farm. Salah in farm, you know, Trent in farm. Uh, Gakpo in farm. <laughs> Gakpo in farm. And with the, the, you know, Aston Villa's poor away record of late. I just see Liverpool edging a very close game, I would say. I definitely think Emery will bring something to the party. I don't believe this would be a walkover. I believe they will be solid in the middle, uh, defensively compact. But I feel Liverpool will find a way to score two goals. And I do believe there is a goal in that Aston Villa team, you know. So what for me, I see this one ending... 2-1 in favour of Liverpool. But we move, Leon, and we move to Sunday, the big one, the title decider. Man City versus Chelsea. Of course, by such time, you, you know, Man City would have known the result of the Arsenal game, but I believe win, lose, or draw, once Man City beats Chelsea, the title is sealed mathematically. <laughs> they, they will be no coming back for Arsenal, you know, once, regardless of the result against Nottingham Forest, once Man City beats Chelsea at home, 
then mathematically the title is won. Leon, how do you see this one? I mean, Man City coming off that humbling they Check gave to Real Madrid. Real Madrid. And of course, Chelsea coming off a 2-2 draw last week with Nottingham Forest. How do you see this one? Yeah, I think um, Man City won't be paying no, no attention to this Arsenal fixture. I think it's all in their hands. And after you said after that, I would say not surprising for me because I follow the Spanish league a lot. But there seems to be a different Real, Real Madrid that plays in the Spanish league versus the Champions League. Mm. So after that, um, after that what that victory, I would say, I would say they they would be they are, they are looking to to finish it up as soon as possible. I think it's their last home game as well. So I think they would be very interested in lifting that trophy in front of their fans instead of an away ground. So I think I think Man City has a uh, will be coming out full guns blazing for this. I don't think Pep will be rotating anyone for this one because they have a finals to prepare. They have two finals to prepare for. And the, and the sooner they finish this, this this league, it's it's better for Pep to prepare for the Champions League. So I just think that Man City will, will have too much for Chelsea on this goal. Yes, definitely. Uh, Man City looking to seal up the title there at home. And of course, Chelsea... Uh, not much to play for except pride at this juncture, to be honest. Uh, they're out of Europe. They are not in danger of being relegated. And they are pretty much just seeing out the fixture. So if the Arsenal fans were hoping that Chelsea <laughs> could do them a favor, <laughs> you know, <laughs> this one, I believe, is false hope, you know. It's I believe big. Man City is going to come guns blazing, as you mentioned. I do believe Pep will definitely stick to his principles and rotate a few players, to be honest, as he did in the Everton game. You know, I believe he might bring in a Mares, a Alvarez, you know, a Ressier for maybe a Kevin De Bruyne or a Grealish, you know, just to keep everyone fresh and within rhythm. You know, this is something Pep constantly speak of, that players need to maintain that rhythm. And the only way you can do that is by you know, playing high-level games. So I do believe some of the fringe players, you know, uh, Foden is now back to somewhat a form as well. So I believe Foden might get a game, Mares may get a game, and a few other players may be rested. And of course, if this one is sealed up early, then, you know, the benches may come into play as well. But definitely, uh, Chelsea, Lampard looking to solidify Chelsea somewhat, uh, build some sort of form, build some sort of cohesion. Uh, we see them scoring two against uh, Nottingham Forest, but also on the flip side, conceding two. So defensively, they don't seem to be too difficult to break down at this juncture. And I believe Man City playing in front of their fans after such a brilliant victory against Real Madrid, you know, that was almost like a, a dress rehearsal for this Chelsea game. So I expect a similar Man City to come forward, totally dominating position, totally mm -hmm. taking the game to Chelsea and coming out victorious. I don't believe Pep will allow these players to become anywhere near complacent. I don't and, I don't I don't think Pep team talk will be much different from, from normal weeks. And I think for Chelsea, as you said, they have they really have no incentive to play <laughs> to play this weekend. I just think it's it's probably pride. Not to let the scoreline run up too much. I think yeah. Lampard is is giving different players a bit of a run out, like Mudrich, right, right. the new signings to get acclimatized with the league. So, like for next season, they can have a a good go at it. And um, Mauricio Pochettino, I think that's the coach closest to the job. So right, I just think right. they will go there and try to make a good, give a good account of themselves. <laughs> but, but Leon, question, question to you though. If you're in Lampard's shoes, how do you motivate a group of players like this to come up against Man City and not be embarrassed? Because pretty much that's what I'm looking at. Come I mean, the weekend, to me, if if Man City is totally dominating position and is able to say score an early two goal, yeah. how do these players keep going and and prevent an embarrassment? What do you say? <laughs> I think if Man City gets two early goals, I think it could be trouble for Chelsea. I think no matter what the coach the coach might say, 
I don't think he'll have much of an impact on the players because they know that he will not be the coach right next That's year. What so, I'm saying. so it does he don't he, he doesn't have a ground to stand on really. Mm. So I think whatever he he might say might pass through one ear and go through the next. I think the only thing he can really rely on are the like the academy players because you know they have been in right. Chelsea for a long time, so they may have the Chelsea pride or whatsoever. Right, or the, the, the pride as professional footballers as well. But, you know? but we we can see where that pride <laughs> that pride that pride can quick, quickly disappear after two early goals and Manchester especially against Manchester City where that's playing so well because when Manchester City do dominate a football match, right. They have the they have the ball a lot and that could be the Chelsea players just running around and they'll probably just stop running and you know and the score that, might that, pile up. That is what that is exactly what I am anticipating. One, you know, especially as I said, in front of this Man City crowd. If they were to concede two early goals, it could definitely become an embarrassing scoreline. Really? You know. But in terms of a scoreline, what say you? How, how do you see this one panning out and what's your predicted score? I mean, I think it's hard to predict a scoreline for this one. I think it's, I would say it's definitely a Manchester City win. I think if everything goes well, it should be a Manchester City win. But a scoreline is that it could be ugly, as you say, and it could be a one deal. I just don't know. So I'll just, I'll be joining you on the fence for the scoreline this one. But I do predict <laughs> a, a Manchester City win. For me, I'm just going to go out on a limb for this one. I think Man City is going to run away with this one and I'm expecting Man City to win three goals to nil. That, that's my predicted scoreline. I just think this Man City team is motivated. They're going for the treble. They're looking to make history or to, you know, repeat history, so to speak, and win that treble, win the EPL, win the Champions League, win the FA Cup and... At the first time of asking, I believe they're going to seal up the EPL title come this Sunday. And, you know, their final game will just be almost like a dead rubber, almost like a practice match, you know. Those players who may need a cap here or there in order to qualify for a medal, <laughs> you know, they get a run out. Or those in need of match sharpness will get a run out. But the big boys, for sure, sealing this up, you know, for that final game, all the big boys will be wrapped in wool and cotton. And, and, you know, getting ready for those massive finals, the FA Cup and, of course, the, you know, that elusive Champions League. So, for me, I see Man City running away with this one. Three goals to nil. But definitely, even if it's not three goals, I see nothing other than a Man City win for this one. I just think too much motivation and there's nothing for Chelsea to play for except pride. And, of course, this one is taking place at the Etihad as well. Everything well, the stars is just aligning for me. The stars is just aligning, you know. Is is definitely just their year, and we must start talking about Pep being the greatest manager of all time. For me, he's already the greatest manager of all time in my eyes, without even winning the Champions League with Man City. He is well, almost me. similar to Messi. You know, the only thing persons could say about Messi was that he hadn't won a World Cup. No, he has, and we see people trying to move the goalpost, but that goalpost is cemented in. <laughs> There's no moving it. There's no more excuse. All the boxes are now ticked. You know, I think, and... for Pep, I think the excuse that they used, I think it was a poor one because he already he's already win, he already won the Champions League at Barcelona. So he had he has nothing else to prove. And I think people always saying that he he hasn't built that team, he's always spending money. But a, a manager of Pep quality is always gonna go to top clubs which has money and he's gonna he, he's going to buy players that fits into his style. So I don't think this Champions League will do anything but cement his place in history. Yes, and many managers have failed. That has been given money as well. Charlie. Many a manager have failed and Pep have remained Relevant. at the top of his game. You know, and been constantly all... changing his system. Uh, of course, of course. So, you know, credit must be given where credit is due. But, Leon, in terms of these other fixtures taking place, especially down there in the basement... How do you see, you know, this relegation fight panning out? We see, or we saw Le Leeds, you know, uh, getting a result there against Newcastle drawing. While on the flip side, we saw Leicester pretty much being totally dominated by Liverpool. Leicester yeah, versus Newcastle is coming up as well. How, how do you see the relegation fight going? Um, Leicester versus Newcastle, like, I think it's another lose for, um, <laughs> for Leicester because, as you know, 
Newcastle is also fighting for the top four, mm-hmm. so I don't think they'll be taking their foot off the gas <laughs> for sure. anytime soon. And I think Leicester, I think I I don't know why they're playing so bad this year. I'm just it's just it just baffles me sometimes that a team can play so good well one season and then the next season it's a total different thing. But that's just the beauty of the Premier League and for those teams down at the bottom of the table, it's a real dark fight and at a real any dark point fight it's indeed. Cru- any point is crucial for them this. At any point until the end of the season, so I just I think the managers has to be motivating their players. I think the players themselves have to be motivating themselves and just strap up and prepare for a fight. Indeed. Yes, we also see Nottingham Forest hosting Arsenal as well, another team in a relegation dogfight as well. So that game is definitely one to keep an eye on. And of course, I believe Everton takes on Wolves. I believe, if memory serves me right, so. Also, you know, the, the relegation battle is, is, is tooth and nail. This one is definitely going to go down to that final day, possibly that final kick of the ball where different clubs will be keeping an eye on how the other team matches are progressing, you know. So it, it for me, it's going to be an exciting relegation battle come final day. Uh, by then, the, the league should be sealed up, but the relegation fight is going to be one which may lead or end in a fingernail biting for the fans and tears for for some teams as well. (laughs) You can't really call this one. You just have to wait on the final whistle and then we'll see the fact, you know? Definitely. But, Leon, a quick final word before we end the show on this Uh, weekend's, you know, action of football coming up. Yeah, I think it was a, a a decent week of football. I think it's a decent week of football coming up. And I think, especially me for Manchester United, I think we really need to take care of business and go get this top four because it's in reach and it's up to us, really. Because once we win all our remaining fixtures, we just have to pass the 71 mark for Liverpool not for Liverpool not to catch us. So I just think it's all in our hands. I think... Rashford, Rashford is coming back from injury. I think we got back McTominay, so we need all of our players. To, and Ten Hag is spending more time with the team on the pitches, so it should be a, a decent Manchester United for the rest of the season. Yes, definitely some really nice matches coming up on the weekend. But there you have it, viewers and subscribers. Thank you again for joining us here on Beating the Press podcast. Just like to continue to encourage you to share the platform, continue to subscribe, and of course... Comment and like where you see possible. Of course, I'd like to extend my thanks to Leon for joining us. Sugar Billy was here earlier, but he seemed to have had some connection issues, you know. Hopefully, we'll see him next time. But thanks to Leon again for coming on, sharing his thoughts, sharing his perspectives. Until next time, viewers and subscribers, this is Rafa signing off.